1829, Charles Boyles was born to John and Maria in North Folk, England. He was the third of ten children, having six brothers and three sisters. At age two, his family immigrated to Jefferson County, New York, where he lived, lived on a farm north of Plessis Village. Charles received regular schooling, and by the age of 20, he and his brothers David and James panned the gold fields of the North Folk American River near Sacramento. It must have been favorable as they returned briefly to New York in 1852 before heading back. However, both Robert and David died, leaving Charles the only one to stake the claim. After two years, he was less profitable and eventually packed his belongings back east. He then married Mary Elizabeth Johnson in 1854. He and Mary had four children and lived quietly in the growing city of Decatur, Illinois, where Abraham Lincoln was giving his first political speeches. The Civil War broke out on April 12, 1861, and Charles enlisted a year later on August 13th. He was a private in Company B, the 116th Illinois Regiment and rose shortly after to first sergeant. Under the command of General Sherman, Charles fought in the Battle of Vicksburg on May 26, 1864. He was severely wounded on the right side of his abdomen, and in the care of nurses, he again was mustered out in August to partake in the Siege of Atlanta and the March to the Sea. He received commissions as second and first lieutenant until he was discharged in 1865. Charles' life had become very different. While the trauma of war haunted him, it also shaped him never to see bloodshed again and to apply the survival skills he learned, whether tactical, physical, or bushcraft. He was okay sleeping on the ground and traveling many miles on foot, which would help him later. Upon returning home, he tried farming in Iowa with his wife and now three daughters. But his mind was elsewhere. According to all accounts, he treated his family kindly and didn't swear, drink, alcohol, or use tobacco. But in 1867, he and a friend left to prospect gold in Idaho and Montana. In a letter dated in August, he wrote to his wife about an altercation with Wells Fargo Company agents which insisted on buying the land they were mining. However, Charles and his friend refused, and the agents cut off their water supply, leaving them to abandon the mine. Mary received a final letter later in the month from Silver Bow, Montana, before his disappearance altogether. Penniless, Charles had lost his way and vowed vengeance on Wells Fargo. On July 26, 1875, Charles robbed his first stagecoach in Calaveras County, California, on the road between... Copperopolis and Milton. Having popped out of the brush, he politely ordered the approaching stagecoach driver, John Shine, to throw down the box. Shine looked over the strange man who was dressed in a long linen duster coat and a bowler hat, using a flower sack with holes cut for his eyes as a mask. He held a shotgun, but unknown to the driver, vowed never to use it. He also vowed never to use a horse, something he felt was too unpredictable. Charles shouted, if he dares to shoot, give him a solid volley, boys. Shine looked in the direction he pointed and saw several rifle barrels from the bushes pointed at him. Shine felt outnumbered and handed over the strongbox. It is said that a lady passenger also offered to give up her purse, but Charles refused. When Charles left, the position rifles did not, and seeing how they didn't move, Shine jumped down to inspect them, likely calling out as he did. By this time, Charles had made off with $160 and shine, an empty strong box, and sticks made out to look like rifles. Around this time, Charles took the name Charles Bolton. His heist had led to thousands of dollars a year in a new persona. On August 3, 1877, after holding up the stage between Point Arena and Duncan's Mill, he left an infamous note as he made off with $300 from the strong box. I've labored long and hard for bread, for honor and for riches, but on my corns too long you've tread, you fine hair sons of bitches. Directed at the Wells Fargo Company, expanded on this verse with the second one during a holdup July 25th, 1878. Here I lay me down to sleep to wait the coming morrow, perhaps success, perhaps defeat, and everlasting sorrow. 
Let come what will, I'll try it on. My condition can't be worse. And if there's money in that box, tis money in my purse. Each time Charles left a mark as Black Bart or Poe with the number eight, that is, Poe eight. There would be 28 robberies altogether, with some seeing Charles picnicking before a heist, or like on October 3rd, 1878, eating a hearty dinner. 14-year-old Donna McCreary described the man who ate a meal at their farm as having grayish-brown hair, missing two front teeth, and a deep-set, piercing blue eyes under heavy eyebrows. He had slender hands and was intelligent in conversation, well-flavored with polite jokes. Little by little, other patterns were being noticed by the law, such as cutting the money sacks in a T-shape, and Charles knew it would only be time before they would catch up. On November 3rd, 1883, Charles made his way back to the site of his first robbery on Funk Hill, southeast of the present town of Copperopolis. The stage driver, Reason McConnell, was meant to pick up a young hunter named Jimmy Rolleri, who was shooting near the creek at the bottom of the hill. But when the stage was late, Jimmy walked up the hill and saw the stage driver and his team of horses. Reason explained the robbery in progress and that Charles hid behind a rock with the shotgun and forced him to unhitch the horses and travel over the hill's crest. Charles, meanwhile, found the strong box had been bolted down to the floor. After too much time wasted, Reason and Jimmy gathered enough courage to revisit the scene and fire at the thief. After several shots, Charles stumbled into the thicket and the two gave chase, finding a small, blood-stained bundle of mail. A bullet had pierced Charles' hand, and after running a quarter mile, he had to stop and bandage it with his handkerchief. Hearing Reason and Jimmy in the distance, he stuffed a sack of gold into a rotten log, his shotgun in the hollow of a tree, and continued off with $500 in gold coins. The two reported the crime, and Detective James B. Hume of Wells Fargo traced Charles' steps to a spot where he left eyeglasses, food, and a handkerchief with the laundry mark FX07. The detective brought Detective Harry N. Morse to search around 90 laundries in San Francisco for the stamp until they came to Ferguson and Biggs' California Laundry on Bush Street. The owner directed the detectives to a small boarding house. Here, Charles had an alias as a mining engineer named T.Z. Spaulding and said he made frequent business trips that happened to be at the same time as the robberies. But after pressure, Charles confessed to the crimes only before 1879, believing the statute of limitations had expired on the earlier ones. Further evidence came when police found a Bible addressed to Charles from his wife, Mary. Wells Fargo only charged him with the final robbery, a sentence of six years in San Quentin prison. After four years in prison and failing health, he was released on good behavior in January of 1888. Reporters flocked to see the notoriously dashing Black Bart, but they witnessed a tired, visibly aged man with poor eyesight and deafness in one ear. A reporter asked if he planned to rob any more stagecoaches. No, gentlemen, he replied. I'm through with crime. Although uh, another followed by asking if he would write more poetry, and he reiterated, I'm through with crime. Charles' next move was clear in his writing to his wife, Mary, in which he complained of being shadowed by Wells Fargo, and he felt demoralized and just wanted to disappear. Charles was last spotted in February 1888, going from the Nevada House in San Francisco to the Visalia House Hotel. By 1892, Mary listed herself as the widow of Charles Boyles in the city directory, but not before another stage had been robbed in November of 1888, when a lone bandit left a note that read, So here I've stood while wind and rain have set the trees a sobbing, and risked my life for that box that wasn't worth the robin. Although Detective Hume was called to examine the note, he declared it a copycat, and Poe 8 was never more. History, though, would not put down Black Bart. In some areas where Charles snatched loot, tributes were erected, and in Redwood Valley, California, an annual Black Bart parade brought back the dashing thief. 
This has been Biographies of the West. My name is Lauren Morgan Richards. Thanks for watching.